the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heike when the Postmaster General informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heike? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heike. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish, but when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Heike. Two miles west of Heike, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heike and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heike, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Okay, we're ready to start tonight, so we're going to start like we normally do. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so we'll ask everyone to stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You can have a seat. Um, I was going to try a joke again with this crowd because the last time I tried a joke, it just felt totally flat here. So we're going to try it again. We're going to be brave here. I went to the doctor the other day, and he said I have a hangnail, you know. And he continued examining me, and he said, you also got hammer toes, you know. And as the examination went on, he says, and you have shingles. I says, my gosh, doctor, what am I to do? I think you should see a carpenter. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. It's a little better. <laughs> it's a better. It's <laughs> a <laughs> hard act to follow. <laughs> okay, we're going to have introductions again. We're going to start on this side of the room over here, and we'll just pass the microphone back and forth on this side of the, the room, and then we'll bring it back forward here and pass it on back. And I'm Charlie Bauer from Newton. Thank you, Charlie. Hello, I'm Jen Hudson. I grew up in Cleveland. I live in Elkhart Lake now. Okay, thank you. John Wiegand, town of Centerville. Thank you. Ken Smazel, Rockville. Thank you. I'll pat. I'll take it, sir. There we go. Kirsten Husband, Cleveland. Thank you. Irene Dying, Cleveland. Good. Alice Mathias, Cleveland. Good. Willard Mathias, Cleveland. Niles Clouds, Cleveland. Thank you. Richard Schwartz, Town of Emi. Thank you. Russ Tooley, Town of Centerville. Good to have you. Okay, go right ahead, please. Janet Miller, Cleveland. Very good. Phil Knopf, Cedar Lake. Thank you for coming. Henry Pippard, Cleveland. Good. Rick Byersdorf, Con Mimi. Good. Earl Elder, Town Centerville. Good. Bob Domogolski, St. Nazians. Thank you. Patty Grupe, Town of Centerville. Good. Thank you. Walter Crest, Cleveland. Thank you. Paul Schwinn, Cleveland. Thank you. Clarence Grupe, Cleveland. Thank you. Doris Kettler, Town of Centerville. Very good, thank you. Got a gentleman here, he'd like to speak. Go right ahead, please. Hi, I'm Jim Kettler, the Executive Director of the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership, and I live in the town of Centerville. Okay. Tonight we'll be presenting uh, kind of an overview on the Centerville Creek Restoration Project, as well as a description of the Friends of Hika Bay. Thank you, very good. Go right ahead, please. Good evening, everybody, all you historians, and I'm so glad it is cooler. We must have had about six, we thought, six days of 90-degree weather. Yeah. Lots of uh, statistics have been broken, but I don't have the correct number, so I better not say anything. So um, welcome to the meeting of the Greater Centerville Historians, and we only have a few simple rules, and uh, the, one of them is that Raise your hand when you have information to share so that Jerry O'Neill can get over there. Always state your full name and always state full names when referring to people. Refrain from using nicknames and please do not visit while uh, 
uh, the video is on or the camera is on, and please uh, silence your cell phones. So with that, we'll let Jim take over. Okay, and thank you, Jim, for coming. Jim, go right ahead, please. Good evening, everybody. I'm glad you're okay. I do have a statistic I saw in the news tonight. The last 12 months are the, literally the warmest 12 months on historical record. Wow. So with all this warm weather, we do have some warming of the, of the planet, I think. Tonight what we're going to do is kind of give an overview of the Centerville Creek Restoration Project that LNRP, and that's the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership, uh, has been involved with for the last three years, actually. And then we'll do kind of a, a film that Jerry and, and folks have put together, and we'll take a break after that, uh, stretch your legs, go to the bathroom if you need to, and then we'll finish up with a, a kind of a broader description of the Friends of Hike of Bay, which is a group that kind of morphed out of the Centerville Creek Restoration project. So with that, we'll get started. If uh, the technology works, there we go. Uh, the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership was incorporated in 2003. I joined the board in 2005, and then when we got some funds to staff up, I put my hat in the ring and was uh, hired as executive director in 2006, and then became full-time executive director in 2008. Our mission statement is very, very simple. It's cultivating environmental stewardship in the Lakeshore region. And I've got kind of that Lakeshore region circled there. It's basically the thumb of Wisconsin. Our watershed is actually defined by the Niagara Escarpment, which is a geological formation that starts with Niagara Falls and goes across the Great Lakes, the Bruce Peninsula in Ontario, ends up along Door County. And if you stand up on the ledge looking over Lake Winnebago, you are on top of the Niagara Escarpment. And so everything that flows east off of the Escarpment into Lake Michigan is the service area we, we uh, kind of focus on. Oops. We have a vision statement that really does focus on water. We, uh, in a couple of years ago in our strategic planning process, really wanted to focus on, on water. And we are part of the Great Lakes, obviously the Lake Michigan Basin. Um, again, we're looking at clean, safe waters. We're looking at uh, recreating and protecting fragile ecosystems, creating recreational opportunities, and looking at sustainable land use. This is, again, our service area. Uh, lots of water in this little neck of the woods. We've got over 300 miles of Great Lake shoreline. We've got several large river systems and lots of streams, lots of inland lakes, and literally countless wetlands. So tonight, I'm going to give a brief overview of the Centerville Creek Restoration Project. This is the old mill, and Kathy and Janet, I know, have lots of old photos that they've been able to provide us, uh, giving some historical perspective and context to the project. Uh, this particular photo, I think, is about 1948. And so if we have an overview, uh, Centerville Creek is actually a pretty small watershed. Uh, it doesn't go far beyond I-43 to the west. It's got two branches. One is the south branch, one is the north branch. Uh, the top photo really looks at kind of the, uh, the mill pond, which is right here. The dam, the original dam was about right there. And that was uh, removed in 1996. The north branch goes up uh, towards LTC and then literally up towards uh, Westview and to the Classic property on the other side of I-43. And the South Branch literally goes through the village uh, along Veterans Park and then crosses South Cleveland Road up past I-43 uh, and towards the Southwest. Just to give a little bit of a timeline, as I mentioned in 1996, the dam was removed because of literally safety issues. Uh, the DNR thought it was a safety hazard and removed the dam, but the village really didn't have a plan for the mill pond after that dam was removed. Uh, they did do uh, an assessment with a river planning grant, and the USACE is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They also did a, uh, an assessment, got a grant to kind of take a look at the mill pond. Uh, in terms of the federal kind of language in that section 206, the purpose is to investigate possible restoration alternatives uh, for the Centerville Creek. 
They did a geomorphic assessment, they did a topographical survey, they came up with conceptual plans, and they came up with a cost of almost $900,000 to restore the creek. Well, the village didn't have a 50% match, and they still don't have a 50% match. $450,000 is a lot of money. So it basically got shelved for a couple of years until uh, LNRP got contracted to basically, uh, let me go through the rest of this here, uh, they also then kind of did a priority alternatives analysis, which looked at doing nothing, doing the Corps of Engineers project, and doing something in between, giving cost estimates. Uh, in 2005, the village was able to purchase property north of Hika uh, Park, which is called the Hika Sands property. And I'll show a map of that, and we are looking at uh, enhancing that property pretty significantly in the next year. Uh, in 2007, the village did a 20-year comprehensive plan that was done by Bay Lake Regional Planning Commission. In 2009, the village of Cleveland uh, did a municipal facilities report. And then in 2009, we were also then given a contract to kind of do a feasibility analysis for the uh, village on and looking at that restoration project. Our contract was really to, again, revisit possible alternatives. Uh, we wanted to look at a variety of designs and instead of a Cadillac version, not necessarily do a Yugo version, but something in between. Uh, we put together a citizen-based advisory committee. Uh, we came up with revised cost estimates and we brought that cost down by two-thirds to about $300,000. Uh, we did some research. Uh, we did a bunch of grant writing and we've actually raised about $300,000 total to do the project, uh, all uh, either federal or state funds. Uh, and again, we're providing overall coordination for the project. And I'm happy to announce we're very, very close. Construction should happen next week. So you're going to see some bulldozers down there very, very soon. Uh, the design elements, Interflu is the company that put together the design. They've done uh, restoration projects like this throughout the country. Uh, they did the one up in Plymouth uh, when they redid the mill pond there. So they're very well versed in, in these kind of projects. Uh, the River Alliance is a group out of Madison that kind of looks at restoration of, of rivers. Uh, UW Stevens Point uh, helped us put together kind of some protocols for design and water quality analysis that I'll talk about later. The County Land and Water Conservation Department uh, provided some expertise and input. Uh, the Invasive Species Coordinator, Tom Ward, has worked real closely with us. Uh, UW Madison, we were lucky to get a group of students uh, from a landscape architect uh, course that used uh, the project as a class project and provided about 20 different professional designs uh, on looking at the enhancements and restoration of both Centerville Creek and Hyka Park. And I'll show a couple of examples of those in a second. And then we have to have all of the land resurveyed uh, and DNH land surveys did that for us. Uh, the Senate Senate Advisory Committee, uh, just putting the names up there, uh, John Kirsch, Don Perron, Erica Hoyle, Russ Tooley, Liz Klesig, Ron Schaber, Carrie Anderson, Fred Zone, Richard Opie, Carla Zahn. Uh, Fred Zone and Richard Opie were a part of the Cleveland Plan Commission, so we have a presence there as well. This is again uh, a picture of the uh, overview of the, the site, and I'm sorry if that print is a little too small, but I can read it for you. This is where the confluence of the north and south branches occur, and the restoration will literally go right up to that area right there. Um, this is the location of the previous dam. Uh, this is then the Pike of Shores property that I was speaking about that was purchased in 2005, and we're going to do a, a major renovation of that grassy area there uh, and recreate uh, kind of a rich swale ecosystem uh, by creating some topography there with excavate literally from the bill pond. And, uh, and of course there's the boat landing right there. Um, we have basically worked with the village to then take a look at Hyka Park and literally increase the boundaries of the park so that this entire area is not going to be part of Hyka Park. The village does have plans to move the physical plant, but that's going to take some time just because again funding isn't quite available. But eventually they want to move that physical plant up to the water treatment plant. And so with that removal, we're hoping then to create some kind of uh, facilities uh, on that side of the park. This is just one of those exa uh, an example of the UW-Madison designs. 
Um, again, they were really professionally done. We've got them electronically as well as kind of in a, I think they're like two by three foot uh, poster boards. And those are all in the village uh, hall. Uh, and they are the depository for those designs. And we really got a lot of really gold nuggets, what I'll call, from those designs that we tried to incorporate in the restoration project. This is just another one of those designs. And so why restore the street? Well, there's certainly a lot of environmental values there. Uh, it's a great natural park within the community. One of the big issues is reducing the sediment load. We have 150 years of sediment backed up there. And every time it rains, we get major erosion off of those stream banks. We have sometimes 8 to 10 foot walls that are just straight up. And any time it rains, you get real serious erosion. And this year, if anybody's been down to the lake, it's been a real bad year for that algae. And that erosion is a major contribu contribution to those algae loads. And so we want to reduce that sediment load significantly through the restoration. We want to improve fish habitat. We want to improve water quality. And we want to get rid of some of those invasive species that I'll talk about uh, a little bit more. But there's also some real significant economic value there. Uh, it's a long-term resource for the community. Uh, it's certainly on the Lake Michigan Circle Tour. People stop by and, and want to enjoy that park. Uh, it'll certainly, I think, enhance land values in and around the park. And we're also planning on putting a kiosk up that advertises local businesses so that as people are driving on that Lake Michigan Circle Tour and, and stopping, they know where to stop for food, where they uh, go for uh, a night stay if they'd like, whatever. And of course, there's social values. Again, it's a long-term resource. Uh, there's recreational opportunities that we're hoping to provide, uh, educational opportunities. We're hoping to work with the Cleveland School. Uh, we're going to create an interpretive trail. Uh, and again, it does tie into the 2007 comprehensive plan that the village put together. Oop, went too fast again. And so our aspirations are really to recreate uh, a living ecosystem, uh, a stream that looks like a natural working and functioning stream. And this is actually a picture of Centerville Creek just beyond the mill pond on the other side of the cemetery on the south branch. So if you walk down the hill from the cemetery and, and take a view, this is what we're trying to recreate. And so with that, we're going to show a film Sleeve shirt. <laughs> 18th, 2012, and we're here in the village of Haika at the uh, area of the lakeshore, uh, Lake Michigan. And we'll start out with this young lady, and she'll introduce herself and tell us a little bit about information she has with her, okay? Go right ahead. Good morning. Please. Good morning. We are representing the uh, Greater Centerville Historians. Um, we are here with um, Bob Domoglowski, Jim Tetler, and uh, Charlie Bauer, and we want to know what this project is all about, and uh, Jim will be explaining it this morning. Okay. They are going to be something, doing something with the dam, and we want to capture it as the progress goes along. Okay, very good. And your residence, where do you live, please? Newton, Wisconsin. Okay, and what highway? County Trunk X on very, the farm. Very good, thank you. And the next gentleman here, nice and loud, please. My name is Bob Domogolski. I live in St. Nazian's, Wisconsin, and I'm here because Jim Kettler invited me to do a bird survey of Centerville Creek, which is the creek behind us, Okay. and it's the dam that we're going to be talking about, and I, I am doing a bird survey for this area. It might go on for years. Okay, very good. And we have the gentleman that we are looking forward to as far as information. He'll identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Hi, I'm Jim Kettler. I'm the Executive Director of the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. We're helping coordinate and facilitate a Friends of Hika Bay group. And part of that work plan is to restore the abandoned mill pond here on Centerville Creek, the mill pond that's behind us. Okay. The dam was removed in 1996, but there's 150 years of sediment built up with a lot of nasty invasive species that we're going to hopefully remove, uh, as well as then basically recreate a meandering stream. Okay. Uh, for Centerville Creek. 
Okay. I live in the town of Centerville, about a mile north of the Lakeshore Technical College on Cedar View Road. Okay. I'm, my family moved to Cleveland in 1970. We bought a farm on South Cleveland Road, the old Arno Hooten farm. Okay. And so I've been a member of Cleveland off and on for since 1970. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. And we have another gentleman here. Go right ahead, please. I'm Charlie Bauer. I'm also with the Greater Centerville Historians, and we came down here this morning to capture the, the ongoing part of this project here. And I think we're going to turn it back over to Jim here, and he's going to kind of lead us on our way. Okay, I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> Jerry O'Neill, also part of the Greater Centerville Historians, and I am the presently the videographer for that group. And uh, they've kindly asked me to be part of the video group here also, and I'm enthused about what we're about to do, and it's good to keep things on record. And uh, I don't know who would like to take over at this point to start things out. I could start okay. talking again. Jim, could you identify yourself one more time? Yep, again, I'm Jim Kettler with uh, the Executive Director of the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. Okay. We're a nonprofit that has a work area extending basically from Manawa County, Kiwani County, Door County, and the eastern portions of Calumet and Brown. Okay. We're a watershed based group that looks at kind of protection and restoration of our waterways. And so the village of Cleveland had contracted. Uh, with me a couple of years ago to kind of revisit the feasibility of restoring Centerville Creek. What we have here is just a watershed map okay. that shows the village of Cleveland. Nice and slow. Okay. And what we're looking at here is basically this stretch of creek, and we'll take a closer look in a, a moment or two. But that uh, dam was put up in the 1800s. I think Kathy can give us the exact date. Okay. Um, but it was removed in 1996, and okay. it was considered a safety hazard by the DNR, All right. and that's why it was removed. Okay. The village of Cleveland really didn't have a plan for restoring the, the creek bed uh, after the dam was removed. Uh, they did look into it, but uh, at that time the cost was just too extensive. Okay. So they contracted with LNRP in 2009 to revisit uh, the feasibility. Could you give us uh, what those initials mean, please? Yep, LNRP is the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. Very and good. It's just a lot easier to say as LNRP. <laughs> I realize that, okay. <laughs> anyway, they uh, contracted with us in 2009, and so we put together a citizens advisory committee and came up with a, a number of designs. We had a collaboration with a UW-Madison landscape architecture uh, class and they put together literally professional designs that the village now has as a, a kind of a, a set of really pretty interesting designs. Okay. And from that, we kind of took the nuggets and the kind of the things that we really wanted to establish, and then worked with a group called Interflu, but that's an environmental consulting firm. Okay. They're putting the design together, uh, and we have now reached that point where construction will begin this summer. We had to go through a DNR permitting process. We had to do soil samples. We had to kind of go through the land ownership and delineation of the land boundaries. But all that is now complete, and okay. so we have a construction window of June 15th to August 15th of 2012. Okay, very good. You mentioned uh, species that were overtaking, and that could be interpreted as animals or plants or something. Could you t distinguish something there? Sure. We're talking about plants and invasive species uh, in terms of plants. We're surrounded by Japanese knotweed. Okay. You see these cane uh, kind of looking stems. That's huh. Japanese knotweed. It's a very difficult invasive species to remove. It was brought into this country as an ornamental for landscaping. Wow. And we'll take a look inside the mill pond. There's a batch of Phragmites, reed canary grass, and a couple of other pretty <laughs> nasty critters. Okay. Animals, there's certainly been deer in this area. Uh, for a long time, I don't think we're going to do anything to basically increase the deer population, but certainly we are hoping to reestablish a fish population here okay. by improving the habitat. Okay. All right. And uh, again, the creek that's uh, flowing slowly be behind us, that would have been the outlet to the lake. Is that correct? That's correct. On the other, on this side of the dam and the dam location, it literally was right there by that ripple. We'll you can get closer and you can actually see some remnants okay. of the dam. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, but that's where that dam was located. And then right after flowing east okay. is Lake Michigan. All right. Uh, trying to get it pinpointed a little bit with the walkway. Can you tie it into me with that? 
Where, right where the water's rippling in the Where it's rippling there. Yep. Yeah. That's part of the basin. Yeah, the white post, the dam oh. will be right on this side oh, really? of that white post. Okay, okay. Very good. And I'm going to take another shot of that map you got there, Charlie. I appreciate that also. I'm going to close up on it. Are you also going to have a bird habitat? We could talk about that. Again, the reason we're doing a bird survey okay. is to really look at the impact restoration will have all over the long term. And so Bob was so kindly uh, offering to do the bird surveys. And so what we'll do is through time, look at what bird species ap appear in the Centerville Creek area, both before and after the restoration. Okay. Certainly we're hoping to kind of recreate a creek that looks like Fisher Creek or Point Creek All right. that has a good solid natural habitat. Okay. Bob, as far as your observations uh, roughly right now, uh, the birds that are prominent in this area prior to any work being done, is anything you can give us? Well, I have only started doing the survey of Centerville Creek in late February. Before this, I've birded here since about 2001, but I never went beyond this boardwalk because I didn't know who owned that property, so I stayed away from it. Okay. I now understand it's owned by the village. All right. And I can go walking in there. Okay. What I'm finding is in this area where they want to get rid of the invasive species, so far there has been no birds whatsoever using it. It's almost like a desert for okay. native species or birds of any sort. Hmm. Uh, now, does, I'm going to ask a question in between, I hate to interrupt sure. you, but the new species of plant life that are going to be here and the present birds, is there a relationship that you're looking for some habitation? Okay, I'm hoping from the February of this year until June when they start work, I hope to be here once or twice a week doing a survey of the birds here. And they'll give us an idea of what's here before then I'm going to do the survey for many years in the future. Okay. And I'm hoping that once the new vegetation is in here, we can find out how that is being used by uh, the different bird species. Okay. As I say, up till this point, the grassy area that they're going to be dredging has had no birds in it at all. Really? And from my experience with this vegetation in the past, mm -hmm. no birds use this habitat at all. It's sort of a desert for anything except these invasive species. It, okay. Nothing else can grow there, no other plants, hmm. no other animals use it. Really? Okay. Uh, getting back one more time to this uh, material that's presently here, how does it replicate itself? Through seeds or just roots, uh, like quack grass type things, or what is it? The Japanese knotweed literally does go through roots and it's rhizomes and spreads that way rather oh, okay. than uh, flowering and, and fruit and seeds. But every invasive species has its own kind of method of spreading itself. Okay. And so it's a, a species by species kind of uh, issue. We are going to have a, a group of trainings this summer with Tom Ward, who's the invasive species coordinator for uh, Manawak County. Okay. And what we're hoping to do is have a training and then have volunteers help remove invasive species, uh, okay. both not only in Hika Park, but in Fisher Creek and Point Creek and okay. Pine Creek and Calvin Creek. Oh my God, all the way through those areas, it's, Correct. It, it's there. Friends huh? of Hika Bay literally looks at those five watersheds, okay. which uh, basically all flow into Hika Bay. Okay, very good. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, I'm presently videoing the uh, Franklin Street, I believe, comes down the from the hill area and enters onto Lakeshore Road, I believe. And this is the area we're presently going to be looking at as far as the information and video-wise some pictures of the old dam location. And of course, this all ends up on Lakeshore Road. But right now, as they mentioned, this particular weed is really taken over here. That'll be corrected. Oh, okay, I've got some gentlemen that are helping out here a little bit for uh, holding up a map that's been presented, and uh, they'll uh, indicate what we've got there. Go right ahead, please. Okay. As part of the restoration of Centerville Creek, we're also looking at enhancing Hika Park, and actually in integrating this restored area as part of Hika Park as a kind of a passive use area of natural habitat. 
Um, what this schematic does is kind of show hike a park. This is the public works building. This yep. is the pump station. This is the gazebo and picnic area. Okay. There's a very important remnant called a ridge swale ecosystem. Okay. One of the few kind of between Sheboygan and Manawak of that left. And what we're going to do is basically take some of the excavate from the abandoned mill pond when we restore it. Yep. And actually create some topography in this grassy area. Okay. And also then plant some native species and recreate a wet meadow. Okay. I have a question pertaining to the photo itself. Was that a satellite photo of some kind or a... Yes, this came off of Google Earth. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, amazing, isn't it? It's pretty amazing what you can do, <laughs> yep. Okay. And so then, we're also then planning yes. on putting a bridge, a little pedestrian bridge, yes. that'll link the north and south parts of the park so people don't have to walk on uh -huh. LS to get to both sides. Wow. We're like, planning on putting some boardwalks in. Okay. We'll probably put a kiosk there that'll recognize donors to the project. Okay. And Is that another name for a sign? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. An interpretive sign. <laughs> Thank kiosk. you. You bet. <laughs> And some of the bit local businesses, so that as people come through, they know sure. where to go to eat, where to stay, things like that. Wonderful. So it's really a comprehensive approach to expanding yeah. Hika Park. Great job. Okay, uh, anything else here at this time, or would you like to move down the pike a little bit? We can move down the pike. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we got the uh, group here and they're on a landing, I believe it's called, of this pathway that's already built here. But there's more information about the original uh, part of it and uh, what it's going to end up to be in the future. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, again, I'm Jim Keller with the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. Thank you. And we're on a boardwalk that kind of overlooks the, the uh, basically now removed dam area. The boardwalk was actually dedicated to Francis Buddha, who was very active in the village for a number of years. And so it was built in 1990, and uh, just extends a little bit around this curve. We plan to rebuild this boardwalk and then have a viewing deck kind of at the end of the, uh, right where the dam used to be located. Okay, very good. And there is presently some water slowly meandering down behind you, is that correct? Correct. The, the creek does have an annual flow, it keeps a, a pretty good flow even in summer. Okay. It's it pretty slow. Uh, but certainly there, there's typically a flow year-round. Okay, and I think someone mentioned this uh, is fed by two other creeks that come together in the area? Correct, the North Branch and the South Branch of Centerville Creek. And one thing that we haven't talked about yet is that we're doing extensive water quality sampling throughout okay. uh, both the North and South Branch. Okay. Uh, we're expanding our sample sites to 10 different sample sites in 2012. We have two interns from UW Manorwalk working on that project. Wow, great, great, okay. Uh, let's see, Kathy, I think you have some photos in your folder maybe of something that might work out with this too.
Okay, we're taking some video of the surrounding buildings uh, in the from where the dam was. Okay, I'm with uh, Mr. Charlie Bauer. He's uh, accompanied me here at the uh, to Haika, and he's got some information that would pertain to the dam, the old dam, I guess. Yeah. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, we're expanding exactly where the where the dam used to be, and when the camera pans around here, the camera will be looking north, and you can see the, the pile of rocks there, and then the height of the, the ground. Okay. The, the, the mill building itself was up that high. Holy cow, we're now, talking. You just pan right around, yep, gotcha. all the way around, and you, you can see the rest of our group here. Yep. And then as the camera goes over to the south side, you can see the opposite side again. You can see how high it was. So there was a lot of, the height of the dam was pretty high. Yeah. Can yeah. you give me a footage, a rough one? Oh, God. That's, what, that's more than the 20. From the bottom to the top? That's more than 20 feet, I'm, I'm guessing. A rock that were planted yeah. in there, if you will. And you can see that there's concrete still at the bottom. They, they tried dynamiting that out. There, there's <laughs> ledge there, and there's concrete down in here. Okay. So this is actually the site. Of where the on dam the dam, was. the so base of the dam. The base of the dam, right. Okay, very good. Okay, Kathy, why don't you explain a little bit of what you're holding up there? We're holding up a photo of the dam to show nice the long. height of it and also the length of it. Okay. There was a broad uh, walk across it. Okay. And as you can see, the gray building in the back is the Haika Bay Tavern. And this is what the Haika Bay Tavern was at oh, that time. Okay. Well, and this photo says June 28th, 1942, and that had to be before, it, shortly before it washed out. Okay, very good. Boy, that was a magnificent looking. Boy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead, please. The history of the Haika Dam, the original dam, the wooden structure, was constructed in 1864 by Gutleaf Mill. He and his brother August had had a dam and sawmill on the Fisher Creek. This dam washed out in 1864 and the area was abandoned in favor of the Haika area. The Haika Dam remained in place until 1906 when a concrete one was built. A sawmill, lumber yard, and flour and grist mill were built on the north side below the dam using the water power. In 1892, the lumber yard moved to Cleveland because of the railroad being there. The flour and feed mill operated until 1914. The Haika Dam washed out in 1924. After two successful money-making picnics, the present dam was dedicated August 9, 1936. In 1942, a heavy rainfall washed away the soil at the end of the dam, the ends of the dam. The water on the north side of the dam were so turbulent that the foundations of the mill were undermined. It collapsed and floated onto into Lake Michigan. The waters backed up from this dam go about a mile to the west and north. There are two streams of the Centerville Creek. One runs through the LTC campus. Okay, very so, good. Thank okay, you. Now I we got a gentleman here who has some information in regard to the initial uh, problems that erupted when it was flooded out here. Go right ahead. Okay, according to Myron Sohn, who has lived in this area all his life, when the dam washed out in 1942, the turbine for the dam was washed down creek into Lake Michigan and today is out in Lake Michigan somewhere beyond where the creek enters. Okay, very good, very good. Now, again, I got a question for Jim here. Mm -hmm. uh, the surrounding buildings that are located up there, any uh, knowledge about those at this point in time that you could tell us? One building, and Kathy has a picture of it, is literally straight ahead of us. Okay. That's the Haika Bay Tavern. Okay. And supposedly that's the longest continually licensed tavern in Wisconsin. Okay. It was literally part of the trail from Green Bay to Milwaukee. Really? Okay. Okay. So people uh, were able to stay there and have a it meal had, and a it, gusto? It had, yes, it did have a overnight accommodations as okay. well. Okay. Any other buildings in back here that you can recognize or tell us about? No, I think most of the other ones are, are fairly probably new homes. Okay. Or newer homes. Okay. And as far as I asked Mr. Bauer this, but maybe you have an estimate or, or measurement to work with, the distance from the bottom of the base of the dam to the ridges that, that we see, where, what do we look at for feet? 
certainly, if we look and if you pan over this way, yeah. you'll see on top of the rocks, literally some remnant mortar work. The dam went about that high, and so okay. it was about a, what would you say, 30 to 40 foot dam. Okay, all the way across there then. All the way across. Yep. Holy cow, okay. And as far as any knowledge of the uh, tail race uh, opening, is there anything on that? Where, what side of the dam it was? Well, it, the tail race had to be on the, on the north side to come out because That's where the, the water, water was built mm -hmm. up 30 feet and the mill oh. sat up there. So when the water went through the mill, it just returned right back to the creek here. Okay. It didn't right. have to go downstream to catch up with the creek. Okay, so it was not immediate. Right. It was so immediate. The turbine was set. Yeah. Okay, yeah. very good. Okay, any other thoughts anybody has? The we, we got a picture here, Jerry. Okay, I'll, I'll just one moment. <laughs> okay, we got a young lady here, and she'd like to identify herself, and she's got a picture she'd uh, like to show off a little bit. Go right ahead. I'm Kathy Sixel, and I wanted to show the dam before it collapsed. Okay. And there was a, a walkway across. Okay. okay. And here's another picture of the dam, and okay. behind it you can see St. George Church. Oh, here. Okay. That is hold it George. steady. Hold it steady. Thank you. Okay. And this is the dam as it uh, after it collapsed. Oh, after it collapsed. Oh, not the dam, the, uh, the mill. mill. This mm -hmm. is the mill here. This you can is see the how mill. Wall, the, the, the building oh, just kind of came I away see. here. Okay. The mill pond. That's the mill pond. Yeah. And the dam is down, I it's see the right mill front. back in the background yeah. there. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. Okay, and mill back, pond. And back here. Okay, we're looking at a, a view here that's taken many years ago, perhaps. Go right ahead, please. Uh, this is the, the Coiny Mill. This is the uh, bell of the Badger Fire Department, and again, the walkway. And Ken Brookson told me he can remember when this collapsed that the uh, chickens floating down. They had chickens at this mill, and they floated <laughs> down the creek into Lake Michigan, oh, oh and God, they were running all over. <laughs> And I think that, uh, Bob, you had some information regarding the equipment of the mill when it collapsed. Well, that was the turbine I, that I mentioned that before you mentioned that before. Okay. floated out into Lake Michigan. Okay. Was there any uh, other debris that was kind of highlighted uh, as far as what went out there, too, that anybody uh, I mentioned? I really don't know that. Uh, I'm sure a lot of stuff went out yeah. onto the lake. Yeah. Okay. But I, if the turbine went way out there, I'm sure a lot of other stuff I'm sure that it isn't did. quite so heavy went out there also. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, this is the outlet, if you will, of the stream going out of the village of Haika to Lake Michigan. We're just taking a shot of that heading to the east. Okay, got a gentleman here and we're still down on the boardwalk if you will and he'll describe a few things that are pr presently growing here. Go right ahead. You bet. Again, I'm Jim Kettler with the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. What we're looking at here is literally where the water would have been, and I ice skated here as a, a kid. Oh, really? Great. But um, what you're looking at is literally a lot of reed canary grass, which okay. is a, a, an invasive species. It gets very dense. Okay. But you'll see a little bit further, that's probably about a six to eight foot in sized stream bank. Yeah. Further in, we've got eight to ten foot walls that are just cut like that. Wow. And so all of that's going to get restored into a, a, a normal functioning okay. Okay. stream channel. Will there be any kind of rock or anything to prevent erosion uh, just Correct. because it happens? What they'll do is they do a bunch of bioremediation where they actually have biodegradable mats that hold the vegetation in place. Oh. They also put in some merged logs that actually hold and, and stabilize, especially with oh. uh, the meanders. Yeah. Because they will create a meandering stream okay. that will be in basically enhanced fish habitat. Okay, okay. If we go a little bit further, uh, the next film clip I'll show you Phragmites, which is a, again a very bad invasive species. It's really? Really becoming quite problematic for the wow. northeast part of the state. And you're presently saying this is canary grass? This is reed canary grass and when we move forward I'll show you where that Phragmites okay. is. Now to my understanding if they have roads being built or anything like that and ditches that they provide Canary grass at one time, I believe, was a plant they planted. That's correct. It was actually introduced as a, 
a, a plant that stabilized kind of banks on yes. construction sites because it does grow so dense and yeah. so thick. Yeah. yeah. But it cakes over oh. and and basically goes where it's not supposed to go and then displaces native species. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay, as Jim indicated that uh, there's plenty of grass and canary grass that he mentioned that are invasive, but uh, I was just asking you about the mechanical part of it is the scooping of the remnants of this bed. What it would all take? Right ahead. You bet. It, it'll take big equipment. They're going to have a, a big backhoe and a big cat, and what they do is basically divert the water around where they'll actually be doing the reconstruction oh. and do that in a stepwise sequence so that really? they don't have the water flowing through the area that they're digging. Sure, sure. And they just create this series of stepwise diversions okay. and then get pretty big equipment in here with dump trucks okay. uh, and taking that excavate out. Wow. That's and a... so on this side yes. is where we'll actually have access for those dump trucks. Okay. So they'll build a pathway down. Mm -hmm. There's some high ground right where they're standing there right now. There's a path already. Okay. And we can move over in that direction. Okay, very good. Now they, the people that are doing this, uh, while they're trying to do good, now they have to prevent any erosion at this time too with the fresh conditions that are going to be coming about because of digging out things. Correct. And so again, they'll do a lot of bioremediation that'll stabilize those stream banks. Okay. You should note that every time we have a rain event, yep. we get a lot of sediment loads into the stream. Okay. Because these inside banks, anytime there's water rushing against them, it's just carrying sediment Everything into Lake Michigan. eroding away. Right. And so one of the objectives and one of the real benefits will be the minimization of uh, erosion coming out of the stream channel once it's restored. Okay. All right. Very good. Is there anything... Uh, downstream or upstream, I guess is a better term, that is there to prevent all that from gathering down here. There is very nice functioning uh, stream channels that we're basically looking to replicate okay. right beyond the mill pond. Uh, we have a couple of forested nice meanders where Centerville Creek basically splits between the north okay. and south branch. All right. And so we've got very good habitat basically upstream from this uh, mill pond area. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much, sir. Okay, as we're walking on this higher ground, uh, Bob is indicating there might be a remnants of something here. Go right ahead. Okay, right behind no. here where this, this Nice and loud, Bob. Over. Under there is the remnants of the dam, the actual dam is okay. right under there. All right. There's a lot of stone that might show. Okay. And the Coiny Mill was on the north side of the dam, yeah. and I think in the ground here you can see a foundation of a building, and this might be the foundation of the Coiny Mill, right? Coiny Mill, right, right here. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're looking at an older picture, and uh, this gentleman will indicate what we're looking at. Go right ahead, please. Again, I'm Jim Kettler with the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. We've got a couple of historical photos. The first one is an ice skater taken in 1938 okay. that should be basically looking about this way across the, uh, okay. the old dam. Yeah. And I, back in the 70s, I used to ice skate here too, everyone. So. Wow, great. <laughs> the second image yes. is basically kind of looking at uh, where we're standing. We would have been on top of the mill pond, and then if you can pan that way, you're okay. basically looking towards Hika Bay Tavern, okay. up and above over the mill pond area. I'll come back. But we would be on top of the mill at this point, okay. being it's... quite high up. Yes. Okay, I'll come back to you with that picture one more time. I'll take a steady shot of it for just a moment to get a dwell on it. Excuse me, I'm Kathy Sixel, but this yes. would have been the brewery. Okay, thank and you. And this would have been St. George Church. Okay, okay, and there's the mill pond in the foreground? Correct. All right, and could you point out the uh, tavern that we know as Hika Bay Tavern? This building right here. Okay, that ties it pretty well together there. 
And again, this would have been taken from the mill, is that correct, that was here, the building? My guess is that we would be standing on top of the mill, okay. looking down onto the mill pond. So we got the directions uh, correct here as far as where we were looking. By the way, could you tell me what direction we are looking at? We would be headed basically southwest. Okay. And then the final photo okay. is literally looking ah. towards the lakefront. Okay. And what you're seeing here is the mill, and the dam would have been on this side of the mill. Okay. The old Rutherford Hotel, and then of course Lake Michigan in the background. Would that be uh, Strotman's or Rutherford's? It had been Strotman's and then it turned into Rutherford's. Oh, okay. Okay, I didn't realize. Okay, uh, very good. From where we're standing, you're looking yeah. directly east. Correct. And Lake Michigan would be beyond. We're us. just looking as if we were there right now. Yep. Okay, very good. Well, good job there. Thank you. Okay, Jim, I wanted to. Okay, we got a young lady here. She'll identify herself and indicate what we're looking at. We had this photo before, and the caption states it was December 1938, and it was Glenn Whitty and his father Clarence Whitty. Okay. And they uh, have a question mark firehouse in the background. They were wondering if that was the firehouse. Okay, very good. I'll take a photo, hold it. Because it is true. I mean, it is a desert. Yeah. Okay, we're uh, observing the present situation. Uh, this is uh, 2012, March 19th, and it will be changing dramatically later on this year in the summer when they dig all this out of here uh, to relocate uh, the stream, I believe, and also the, the grasses that are presently choking off everything. And this is what they want to work with. <laughs> We're looking again to the east at this point in time. We'll end up here on the walkway. Okay, we're looking at some of the uh, weeds, I believe you would call it, that are overtaking the area, but this gentleman will indicate what's going to be happening. Again, Jim Kettler with the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. We're just taking a look over my shoulder at a patch of Phragmites, which basically got established just a couple of years ago. The Phragmites is a very aggressive invasive species. If you drive over the big bridge in Green Bay and look over the bay, yeah. the entire area is Phragmites. The DNR is literally spending hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to eradicate it. Oh. And it, once it gets established, it's quite difficult to get rid of. Mm. And so the restoration, though, will remove that entire area okay. uh, and that entire patch. We also wanted to just talk about funding for the project. Yes. It comes from donations. Okay. Uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation gave us a grant of about $150,000. Cleveland State Bank donated another $10,000 to the project. And we've had a number of other smaller donations and private memberships to Friends of Hika Bay. Okay. We do have an annual fundraiser in the town of Centerville, an annual barn dance that does provide funding for our indirect support okay. uh, and organizational support. Okay, where but is that held by the way, if I may the, interrupt? The barn dance is at the Saxon Homestead okay. uh, with the Klesik family. Sure, sure. And this year it'll be on September 22nd. We're actually adding a historical element called the Chautauqua, which used to be a traveling tent that allowed rural people to have entertainment, cultural exchange, and education, and we're bringing in Will Allen from Growing Power to talk about sustainable food systems. Okay. So we're going to do the conversation under the tent from 3 to 5, and then a barn dance from 5 to 10. Very good. Well, you've got a lot of knowledge in your head up there. i got to say, you do a good job. Thank you very much. You bet. Okay, i got two gentlemen here, and they'll identify themselves, but we'll start with this uh, gentleman here in regard to the animal life, I'll use that term, and the area, and we, I myself have not seen anything, but he says he's picked up a few things. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, Bob Domodolsky, St. Asians, and I'm the guy who's doing a bird survey for this creek where they're going to be dredging. Yes. Uh, Jerry is saying that he can hear birds, and he's wondering what they are, and yes. they're rather common spring birds that'll probably be nesting here. Uh, one of the birds that's singing in the background, not at this exact moment, but has been, is a song sparrow. There's 
I've counted about eight song sparrows here this morning when I did my survey. Okay. Uh, another bird that's going to be nesting in here and, and is making noises most of the time is a red-winged blackbird, which just called. Okay. And that's... grackles are in here. Uh, in the trees, uh, especially in, in uh, the cedar trees that are growing on the edges here, there yes. are uh, black-capped chickadees, white-breasted nuthatches, downy woodpeckers, uh, red-bellied woodpeckers. As I mentioned before, in this grassy area that you, that you have just filmed, yes. with all these exotic plants, nothing lives in there. These birds are really? living in different parts of this valley, not related to the grasslands here, because it's really? basically a desert for any other form of life besides those weeds. Wow. I had wood ducks here this morning. They could be, they, they flew out of the woods over over here, they're probably nesting in a hollow in one of these trees here and, and using this area as a nesting area. Okay. But again, the survey has just started. I'm thinking when spring comes here, we're so close to Lake Michigan, just like Fisher Creek, this will be a great place for migrating warblers and pastorins to spend a day or so to okay. store up on nutrients for food and then move on north for their nesting territory. Okay, very good. Now, uh, there's a gentleman that's uh, you were talking about a concern for the birds while the excavation takes place, but I think this gentleman said there's going to be some uh, uh, corrective measures for that. Go right ahead. Correct. Please. Jim Kettler from the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. Again, over my shoulder, we're looking at some uh, kind of woody habitat that we're hoping to retain okay. and then continue to actually plant uh, trees to recreate a wet cedar swamp. Uh, that's the okay. kind of community type that uh, would be typical around here. Okay. Uh, so we're looking to planting uh, good-sized cedar trees, maple trees, basswood, uh, to recreate a, a very healthy habitat uh, that can, in fact, bring back some of the native bird species. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, I uh, see the brush along the banks here. Is that going to be disturbed or taken out of there at all? It all depends on how high on the bank it will be. We're going to be building basically benches with that floodplain benches oh. and then planting trees on those benches. So okay. we don't want to remove the heavier woody plants that are here, the trees, yeah, uh, but kind of enhance and complement those trees okay. with further planting. Very good. Thank you very much. Good job. Okay, and with the gentleman that are involved in this uh, picture a little bit, and he'll describe the locations of various streets and so forth that would be necessary to orientate ourselves. Go right ahead. Again, Jim Cutler with the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. What we're showing here is just an overview of the project area. Okay. Here was the original dam, and that's where we were on the boardwalk. Keep your right finger now, there for a minute, if you could. Right there. Thank you. We're standing literally right here, All right. looking this way. Okay. And so you can see that mill pond area, and this is where the North Fork yep. and the South Fork come together. Okay. We'll restore all the way up to these two points. So this entire area will get a restoration and a okay. stream that's going to get rechanneled. And you're going to take this dirt here and use some of it. You're going to haul it to over here someplace? Correct. This is Hika Park, and so as I mentioned earlier, yep. we're really taking a comprehensive view of expanding Hika Park to include this nat restored natural area. Okay. This is just a grassy field right now. So we're gonna take some of this excavate yep. and literally create some topography and restore a wet meadow there. Oh. Which would then be integrated into this little community type. Sure. This is that ridge swale ecosystem. Okay. And so here's Franklin Street again. Okay, gotcha. That's right behind us. We're yep. standing right here overlooking the mill pond. Okay. Just a nice map. That, that's a beautiful <laughs> map, boy. We, <laughs> that is well done. <laughs> now, was that an aerial photo from a plane, perhaps? That's correct. Okay. But these images you can find on the internet very easily. Really? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have to go to a certain um, dot com type thing, or? <laughs> I'm sorry. Typically, if you would just Google the site, you'll find all sorts of maps of different areas. But oh. if you can use Google Earth, the imagery there is really getting Google pretty, Earth. Google Earth. Okay. Uh, and you can really get some great images with wow. great resolution. Thank you for that information. There. 
Well, and again, this photo was taken how long ago? Just so this we one's have a... probably somewhere around 2002, is my okay. guess. Okay. All right. Okay. 2000, 2002. And I again... don't have the actual date on it, though. <laughs> and you indicated there is funding to take care of this whole matter. Correct. Again, we got over $150,000 raised just for the reconstruction project. The entire project, we've raised close to $300,000. Wow. Very. We are going on North Avenue to an area to be used as a reference as to how the new uh, excavating will look like. Okay, you got a gentleman here we've been working with all morning here on the uh, March 19th, 2012, and he's got more information to provide uh, as to what the outcome will be in the future for the uh, area right at the Haika area. Go right ahead, please. Again, Jim Kettler from the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. What we're looking at is literally what we're trying to aspire to. Okay. This is basically a, a creek just off of North Avenue in Cleveland. This is the north branch of Centerville Creek. Okay. The north branch flows through LTC and then up into the egg lands, literally on the Classic family farm, and then uh, starting where the Cleveland Fish and Game uh, location Okay. So those are the two sources of the north branch. Okay. And so it doesn't go very far west of I-43 and you'll get to the headwaters of Centerville Creek. Okay. But again, this is kind of what we're aspiring to, a nice wow. wooded area, nice. Uh, good habitat, good for birds, good for fish. Uh, that's what we're hoping to recreate on the abandoned mill pond. Okay, well, that looks like a good objective here. Thank you very much. So this is the way the mill pond is, what you want the we mill want pond to, to look at it, like that. This is a perfect example of a meander. Okay. That's what we're going to try to recreate. Yep. Oh, great. And that's the word they use, meander. A meander. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is uh, through natural erosion, if you will, or uh, Sure. Control? I mean, through time, obviously, any rain event uh, with spring thaw, you're going to get a high water and you'll get some erosion. But what we're trying to cre recreate okay. is this kind of meander yes. uh, throughout. Now, what we'll do is literally put logs and other woody debris and bury it into the stream banks to stabilize those stream banks. Okay. They'll use a bioremediation -re method that literally creates a, a biodegradable kind of mat on the stream banks okay. and that'll last for two to three years and then eventually decompose. But by that time, the natural vegetation will be in place to hold those stream banks. Okay. I know it was brought up, uh, if you wish to talk about that, uh, like trails and things like that. That is not part of the, what this is all about. What the DNR gave us a permit for doesn't include trails, but certainly trails are part of the 20-year comprehensive plan that the village put together. Okay. They would like to cre uh, literally connect all of their parks, Veterans Park, Dairyland, and Hika Park. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, this looks very pleasing and uh, kind of tranquil, really. Very peaceful. And the water is clear. Okay. And, and this wooded area, acreage-wise, belongs to who here? Uh, I'm pretty sure. I don't know that exactly, but I think it belongs to the farm up here. Okay. Okay, uh, Jim has a little bit of information about the people who will be doing the actual excavation and uh, apparently they're, uh, what do you call it, masters at it. Go right ahead, please. They're not actually going to do the excavation. That'll be a contracted company, but they're the masters of putting together basically plans when a dam is removed to restore uh, various areas. They did the project in Plymouth that they uh, restored that, uh, that stream when they removed the dam and also have done projects throughout the U.S. on, oh, on restoring really? streams and, and rivers. Wow, great. And they, if they are needed, they can do dynamiting and everything to get things out of the way somewhat? Again, I do not expect to see any of that here. Okay. <laughs> uh, the excavating company, whichever one wins the bid, yep. will, will determine what's needed. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, with a group of people here who are very conscientious about the future and uh, in nature also and uh, it'll start over here with this gentleman who's into uh, a activity he likes very much and he'll tell us a little bit about it go right ahead please hello i'm bob domogolski from st nasians and i'm involved with the centerville creek project here basically to monitor the birds as they they change over the next 
decade or so. Okay, very good. Thank you. And we have a lady here. She'd like to talk. I'm Kathy Sixel, and I'm with the Greater Centerville Historians, and I think this is a wonderful project that uh, they are doing to restore our land as well as the woodlands, the birds, the animals. It's great. Very good. And we have a gentleman here also. Go right ahead, please. I'm Jim Keller, the Executive Director of the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership, and we help form Friends of Hike Bay. And so we've got a five to ten year work plan to both, both re protect and restore the watersheds flowing into Hika Bay. Very good, thank you. We got a gentleman here also, go right ahead please. I'm Charlie Bauer with the Greater Centerville Historians and today is the first day of our ongoing project here of watching how they're going to take the old mill pond and change the whole layout of the, of the pond there, how the, how the creek just going to make it meander on through there and uh, I think it's, it's a great thing that they're going to do. Okay, and I myself, Jerry O'Neill, also part of the uh, Greater Centerville Historians as videographer and I'm glad that these folks have uh, decided to get together and talk about it and get it on video so we can have a, a follow-up to what the final uh, outcome will be. Thank you very much everybody. Jerry, one more thing. Sure. Go right ahead. I'm Kathy Sixel and the temperature is in the 60s today. Mid-March. <laughs> Mid-March. Mid <-March. laughs> right, let's get that done. Winter has ended, right? <laughs> some of us are wearing jackets is because you're near Lake Michigan and the cold air off the lake is blowing inland towards the warmth of, of the inland area. Right. Yeah, the lake effect. <laughs> yep. Well thank you folks again for taking the time and it uh, was wonderful that you contacted us. We'd like to be part of it all the way through. Thank you. Okay we'll have to have it quiet for the pr presentation please. Thank you. All right everybody. What I'll do now is just kind of <laughs> give a little bit more detail on the reconstruction and then we'll open it up for questions. This is what the existing conditions look like. And then through that process that I had mentioned and bringing together the Citizen Advisory Committee and getting UW-Madison folks, we basically wanted to do a floodplain bench. We wanted to create some meanders and bends, <coughs> some pools and ripples, and we wanted to maintain some space for future paths. And so what Interflu, and that's the company that did the design, incorporated all of that and so this is basically the design that's given to the contractor and this is what the contractor uses to, to kind of design and, and uh, begin that reconstruction. Uh, you can tell like these are the logs that we're going to put in, um, these are kind of the ripples um, and so all of those things are in place. So, I mean this is the confluence so this is on the north and south branch this is the upper one the one I showed previously is the lower part of that, so it's just the two slides. So this is, again, I just, I'll go through these real quick, but this just gives you some idea of the, actually the method of construction. Uh, I mentioned they kind of bypass, and so they literally create these bypasses, and then pump water so that they can actually work. Uh, this is that bypass hose. They sometimes use check dams to hold the water back, and then divert it. Uh, this is just a dis discharge dissipator so that as they pour water in, it dissipates, it doesn't create more erosion. Uh, so then they'll excavate, uh, they'll have a, a staging area, they'll load it onto the trucks, and they'll transport it out. So this is the kind of equipment that's going to be in the, in the mill pond area. Uh, then they'll do a, a grading uh, along those kind of benchmarks that I mentioned. Uh, they'll do some backfilling, and this is part of that bioremediation fabric that we talked about. Uh, again, these are those benches with that fabric. That fabric will decompose in about three years, but by then the vegetation will be established. Uh, we'll use all native seed and, and planting. Uh, again, this is that matting. And then the woody debris, this is an example of where a log is actually inserted into the stream bank. Uh, again, woody debris, here's the vegetation getting started. This is a year after that restoration had been done. Uh, we'll plant a, a number of shrubs and trees, as I mentioned. Uh, and again, we'll maintain, try to re, uh, create that meandering stream, that woody area, and, and get rid of continually monitored basis. So I just want to talk, because out of this project, uh, we formed the Friends of Hika Bay, and it's been a, a wonderful group of people to work with. 
Uh, a number of folks are even here tonight who are part of that. And we came up with a mission statement uh, that basically says the protection and restoration of the watersheds that flow into Haika Bay. Uh, this is Fisher Creek and this is Point Creek. But this is the area that we're going to be looking at. Uh, each of these watersheds uh, are watersheds that we're going to be monitoring, uh, both water quality, and I'll talk about uh, that in a bit. Uh, this year, we even are going to be doing Karstens Lake, and we're working with the Manawa County Lake Association to look at kind of inputs into Karstens Lake, and then the outputs of Karstens Lake into Pine Creek. Uh, as I mentioned, we've developed a, a work plan uh, we're talking about it, and we have a chair, a partner, and a sponsor for each of those areas. Uh, Heike Park, John Kirsch is our uh, committee chair. We have both chairs, Russ Tooley and, and Bob Dolabelski, here tonight with water quality and habitat monitoring with the bird uh, surveys. Uh, we're certainly looking at invasive species. Ron Shaper is our chair there. Uh, we are looking at watershed management, and we have a Kingfisher Farm, which is a, a really neat little property along the lakeshore, managed by UW Green Bay. Uh, I'm managing, again, the Center of Creek Restoration. Uh, we talked about the barn dance in the film, uh, and Carl and Liz Klesik are our chairs there. Uh, and then we have Jen Huntsman here tonight, who's our new administrative assistant, and she's uh, managing our outreach. Uh, I mentioned John. I'll go through these pretty quick. You saw this map on the film. Uh, we're going to be hopefully working with coastal management on getting some funding this year. They're very interested in the project. And so uh, we're really looking to enhance Hike Park. And so we'll have kind of a passive use area and then the active use area, which is utilizing the same area that the Fish and Game does for their fish derby every year. Uh, we're coming up with bridge designs and boardwalk designs. Uh, the water quality, I, I really want to kind of emphasize this because it's been turning out to be a wonderful partnership with UW Manawak. In the film, I mentioned that we had two interns. Well, the UW uh, Manawak Foundation decided it was such a good project that they actually put a budget line into their budget and created two new internships plus uh, dollars for supplies. So we actually have four interns working with us this year uh, doing sampling across all of those creeks. And it really, we add the data immediately onto our website, and I'll show that website in a second. You can look at the data. Every time they go out, they do a kind of a blog and, and write their kind of interpretations and their observations on our website. And so you can monitor it week by week by week. And Russ Dooley put that website together. And Russ is here tonight, and so I really want to thank him for all the effort that he's put into that website. I mentioned the partnership. Uh, we've had three years. We started with five points on Centerville Creek in 2010, seven in 2011, and now we're up to 10 points. I'll show those uh, sites. But what we monitor is basically the pH, the temperature, the flow of turbidity, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, ammonia, and phosphorus, as well as looking at E. coli content. Uh, the biology department goes out in the fall and does macroinvertebrate, which are all the little critters. And by surveying those critters, you can tell whether they're good bugs or bad bugs. Bad bugs are bugs that are really tolerant to polluted conditions. And unfortunately, that's what we're finding most of. The good bugs are very sensitive to polluted conditions. We're not finding very many good bugs. And so this is just a, a couple of pictures of the students uh, doing their sampling. Uh, this person right here has been an intern for two years, Ethan and really mentoring our, our current interns and doing a, a, just a wonderful, wonderful job. So this is Calvin Creek. We're sampling on 26th Street and then right off of CR on North Hind Road. And then this is where the classes do the macroinvertebrate sampling. Again, all east of I-43. On Pine Creek, on the east side of I-43, this is the only uh, site that we're actually going on both sides. Uh, again, near the mouth, uh, right on Highway U, and then again right off of CR on South Goss Lake Road. And then on the other side of I-43, west of I-43, right here is uh, the interchange with Highway C. We're sampling on Center Road, and then one right as it comes out of the lake, one actually in the lake, and then two, there's one channel that goes this way, one channel that comes this way into the lake. And so we're really trying to monitor what goes into the lake and what comes out of the lake. 
Point Creek, we're sampling on South Goss Lake Road. There's kind of a dead end right here on uh, Bundy Yost property. And then uh, off of Highway X on Wade and Shitty's property. And then again, near the, the mouth. On Fisher Creek, we're sampling at the mouth with the classes. And the water quality sampling is right off of LS. And then uh, basically near the cemetery there, right under the railroad bridge. And this is a uh, center of a quick sampling this year. Uh, we're really trying to capture both uh, the North Branch and South Branch. South Branch comes through here and then goes through Veterans Park. So we're trying to capture what comes into the village. Right off the of center road, what comes out of the village. And then that South Branch kind of meanders here. This is the South Branch uh, sampling point and then the confluence. And then midstream and at the dam. And then on the North Branch, right on North uh, Avenue, and then we want to capture what comes out of LTC because LTC is a major intrusion on the landscape. And we've actually found uh, that quite a bit of phosphorus loading does come from LTC. We're actually changing some of the management practice here, practices here around grass cutting and everything else. So we've had an impact, a positive impact. There's a new horticulture program here and the coordinator of that program is a, a real strong collaborator. And so he's pushing and shoving them a little bit. And so right on Dairyland Road, and then the creek literally runs through the campus here, and then we're sampling here, and then on the end of Washington. And so that captures the North Branch. We've got quite a bit of water quality sampling going. On uh, invasive species and native plantings, Ron Schaefer is our uh, committee chair there. Uh, just a quick description of native invasive species. It's a non-native species whose introduction causes, or is likely to cause, economic or environmental harm. Uh, and that's just on the Wisconsin statutes. But the species that we're really looking at is buckthorn, and uh, two species of buckthorn. And in Hika Park, we've literally removed all of the buckthorn and uh, honeysuckle. Both of these were introduced again as uh, kind of ornamental plants for landscaping. And again, they've escaped into the wild and really do cause quite a bit of damage. And so both of those plants uh, we've spent a lot of time on. Primates and Japanese dotweed, we mentioned that we are uh, hosting training, and our next training is actually August uh, 20th on a Monday night, and we're going to focus on Primates and Japanese dotweed. Uh, should mention Primates really comes from the construction of I-43 and all of the equipment that came down from Green Bay. If you look on the I-43 corridor, you're going to see Primates everywhere, and that's really where it came from in terms of its spread, is the construction of the highways. We're looking at, again, enhancing all of these natural areas. Bob mentioned the kind of habitat for migratory birds. We really want to get rid of the invasive species here and then uh, enhance with uh, native planting so that, in fact, we're really contributing to the, the quality habitat uh, that migratory birds need. We're also looking at recreational opportunities. Uh, Wisconsin is one of the first states that's created a, a water trail called the Lake Michigan Water Trail that literally goes from the Illinois border all the way up Lake Michigan shoreline, all the way around Green Bay. What is important around uh, Hika Park is that it's the only, because of the bluffs, it's the only lake level access between Sheboygan and Manawa. So it's a real important feature if you're on a kayak and bad weather turns up, you gotta get off the lake. But you don't have many places to do it other than Hika Park. And so that's gonna be one of the kind of stopping points uh, along that Lake Michigan Water Trail. And that's been approved. It's on the federal registry already. Uh, just got it done this year. Uh, Jen, and Jen, maybe just raise your hand so everybody knows who you are. She's uh, just started with LNRP. She's our new administrative assistant, and she's going to be uh, kind of chairing our outreach. Uh, we've got a couple of newsletters uh, and uh, websites. Uh, we have an electronic newsletter called The Source, and if anybody would like to get our newsletter on email, just give us your email and we'll put you on that list. Uh, we'd be very happy to send that out. I mentioned the Hika Bay website. This is where all the water quality data is and the kind of historical context of the project. Uh, a number of our proposals are there. A lot of the photos are there. And so if you're interested, uh, take a look there. Uh, we've got a couple of additional websites. The LNRP website, uh, which we update uh, continually. And then we just formed a group called the Lake Michigan Stakeholders. We didn't form it. It's been formed for a number of years, but we just launched the website for that group, and I'm the chair of the steering committee, and that's a group of businesses, government agencies, 
uh, community groups throughout Lake Michigan focused on the restoration of the Great Lakes. Uh, this is just a quick fundraising to date. Uh, this is the Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, but we've gotten a number of other grants and in-kind contributions. Um, I'm happy to say that this year we were able to secure a $30,000 grant from the RICO Fund and another river planning grant to support the Friends of Hika Bay. And so we've been very successful in our fundraising efforts. And our collective vision is really described by this campaign, and we're going to be relaunching this campaign this year. We actually got a grant to relaunch it and do some strategic planning with all of our friends groups, including uh, the Groundwater Guardians, the Friends of the Manawalk River, the Friends of the Branch River, uh, the Friends of Hika Bay. Um, we all live on the water. Life depends on it. Protect it. And this is really what our collective vision is, is a, a very healthy Lake Michigan. That's all I've got. And so I'd love to open it up for some questions. And we want to pass the mic around when we have the questions. Sure. John? John? <laughs> I'll need your name. <laughs> okay. He'll pass the mic. <laughs> I don't want that pass anymore. <laughs> hey, John, he's got an excuse. He's old. I know. <laughs> Go right ahead, sir. Identify yourself, please. John Wiegand. Thank you. I was going to ask Jim, um, you mentioned healthy Lake Michigan. How do we stop <clears throat> walking from Can't seem to do it. Okay. Thank you, John. Good question. Certainly, it is an issue, um, but they have actually done a fairly good job of reconstructing uh, a lot of their wastewater treatment plant. We had Kevin Schaefer up here, who's the head of Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, and the research really shows that we are the source of our problems. Milwaukee, when you look at the currents during the summer, they're actually southerly. And so most of the Milwaukee effluent is heading south, not north. So when we look at the problems on Lake Michigan, around Cleveland, it's our problem. And so certainly Milwaukee has its problems. I'm not going to dismiss the problems that they have. But when you look at the effluent coming out of their wastewater treatment plant, it's actually heading south. This is well documented by the Water Institute out of UW-Milwaukee. Uh, so when you look out your window and see the problems with the algae issues and the pollution, it's our problem. Okay, very good, thank you. Anybody else, please? Okay, would you, nice. Kathy Sixel. Thank you. Where they're going to take the soil out of, next to the That's creek, and they're going to put it in this little piece of land, and you said you bought this piece of land. Who owned that piece of land? Prior to the village, you mean? Well, did the village buy it? The village owns it, yeah. It is village property at this point, as, it, as of 2005. You know, I, I forget who the private landowner was at that time. It was a private landowner, yes. And I don't know that name. Oh, Janet, do you perhaps know? No. Um, my cousin mentioned today somebody wanted to build um, condos. Condos there or apartment buildings or something. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who the previous owner was. I could find that out, but I don't know. It was, just a, it was a piece of private land. Correct. I'm owner Matthias. Thank you, Lord. Uh, what I want to know, where is all this land, I mean, this field going to go, not in that little area alone. It's got to go on some farm fields. You've got all the stone and all this other things. It's got to go someplace. Have you got a place that, where it's going to be going? Thank you. No, it is a good question. Um, the DNR designated as upland soil, and so we can literally do anything with it. We don't have to go through kind of any cleanup with it or anything else. We did soil samples. Uh, to build those benches, we'll use some of that and then put it into the toes of the hill uh, that exists there and build those floodplain benches. Some will go along that hike of bay. Uh, we are going to take about 20,000 cubic yards out of there. And so the remainder literally will go to the contractor who can use it for other projects. And by giving it to the contractor, we get our price reduced because it's good topsoil. So, no, it's a good question, but we have a plan for it. I got a question, please. You're going to have to wait your turn, Charlie Bauer. I got a question. <laughs> we, we just heard that a lot of the invasive species came down from I-43. Now, you're taking this dirt out of there, and we've seen all the different noxious weeds growing in there. How are you going to treat that before you put the soil back on somebody's property or whatever? 
Yeah, the reality is that we're going to have to literally kind of, well, I'll call duke it, with heavy-duty roundup treatment uh, for that first year. Uh, we have LTC actually already growing what they call plugs uh, for the revegetation on Hika Park. And what you'll do there is then just kind of put a five-gallon bucket or something over those plants when you spray. But it is going to take some very active kind of prevention of uh, those invasive species coming back because a lot of those seeds last for years. Uh, we got to get the roots out. We'll try to burn where we can. Um, but it is going to be something that we're going to need to be focused on. Okay. <laughs> Your name is off. Thank you. Did I hear correctly that behind the dam there was about 10 feet of sediment? And then apparently when the dam broke, a lot of it washed out and went downstream. So are you going to be removing all of the sediment that was collected behind the dam plus what was washed out below the dam? What was washed out is down in Lake Michigan. There's no way we're going to get to that. Uh, the remaining excavate or the remaining sediment there, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to take about 20,000 cubic yards out, which isn't everything, but it's a, a fair portion of it. And through the kind of rechannelization uh, and creating those meanders, we take as much out as we need to take. We don't want to take more because when you take soil out, there's a cost. And so we really want to monitor kind of how much we take out and kind of optimize the amount we take out. Um, and as the earlier question kind of alluded to, we've got a place for that excavation. And uh, I'd like to ask, now with the debris that's in the pond area, is, you say they're going to torch this thing to get rid of most of it? Is that how it is planned? Because it looks like a, a bulky kind of thing to get rid of. I think we're going to burn very much. I'm hoping that will actually allow it to decompose in a compost kind of pile. Okay. Um, certainly they're going to scrape uh, before they actually do any excavating. Uh, they'll do a kind of a primary scrape and put that in piles and hopefully a lot of that will decompose. But um, there might be some burning. A lot depends on what the contractor gets in there and what the conditions are like. Okay, very good. Charlie Bauer with another question. Um, just a while ago on the news, they were talking about some river or lake that went way down and they found a gun from a bank robbery. When, when you start cleaning out the mill pond, are, are you be looking for any historical things that might have been left in there, you know, buried treasures or ice skates or something? <laughs> Charlie, that's your job. <laughs> I hear there is a safe. <laughs> Certainly, if something comes up, we'll pull it out and put it aside, but I have no idea what we'll find. Go ahead, please. John Regan. Thank you. Do you work with the Cleveland Fish and Game on certain projects? Certainly have. Um, they know about the project. I'm hoping that they'll uh, make contributions to some of the native plantings as we uh, begin the restoration. Um, I'm hoping to get input on the bridge design because the bridge will be located very near where that uh, kind of picnic area is. Um, and so, yes. And husband, did you say how deep the water would be in this new little creek? I mean, any ideas? It will really depend on the water flow and rain and, and everything else. Uh, certainly, there is an annual flow in that stream. Uh, what we do is not going to create more water. It's really about what happens upstream and with rain and snow and everything else, pre precipitation. Uh, so it'll be, certainly we're going to dig a couple of deeper pools for cold water and uh, for fish habitat. But those will be just kind of very localized pools. Uh, main channel, I can't imagine it being deeper than a couple of feet unless you have a major storm event. In, in, 19, oh, off, in 1998, there, there was a major storm that went through the area, and we had, I know in Sheboygan, about 11 inches of rain, and out towards Keel, we did too. Is this plan going to take into account uh, a major storm and runoff and so on? certainly part of our thinking, and that gets back to that woody debris uh, kind of put into those stream banks for stabilizing those stream banks, that bioremediation to stabilize those stream banks. Uh, certainly, 
a hundred year flood is a hundred year flood, and you're gonna have damage anytime you have a hundred year flood. Um, you can't anticipate the power of water when you, you know, if you have a major rain event with snow melt. Uh, I used to work out in Washington State, and literally the Nooksack River changed course overnight because of a major flood event. There's no way you can anticipate that or, or kind of plan for it. Uh, but certainly the kind of structures that we're putting in place are anticipating rain events and trying to prevent any kind of damage. Was anybody, pardon Jerry O'Neill, was anybody uh, on site when the dam went out that is here tonight? In 1942. Anything that you, could, uh, you observed or saw? Anything you observed or saw that day yourself? I was a young boy, maybe about 14 years old. Okay. And uh, my sister and I were delivering milk in Haika, and we were sitting down there and watching. It's, uh, it's, uh, the mill is going to go anytime, anytime. And we were watching, and we just kept watching. And my mother and dad were waiting for us to come back. We were wondering what happened to us because of all this rain. But we had, in, in back of our dairy, right in the village there, we had water right up to the back of the dairy. That's how much water was there. Wow. And that all the way down, and, and a lot of uh, where there was a bridge uh, along the roads and stuff, we had to tell our drivers to be careful not that they got to this bridge and then it was washed out in the front yeah, of it. Right. So they had to be careful that day. But. Uh, uh, I remember the chickens going out into the, to the lake and few pieces of the dam or the mill. But it, it was very interesting to see all these people down there that they, everybody, I think, in, in the village of Cleveland, whatever, and Haika, were all down there just watching this, uh, what's all going on. But the best was when the, all those poor chickens, they didn't know where to go and <laughs> flying around. And, and they couldn't fly too far because they weren't trained to fly. But mm. so you, whatever they could land on, they went and they just fell into the lake. Mm. So uh, what, what else would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you catch any suckers when you were no. down? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'm sure glad that uh, they're doing something about this settlement that's coming in, uh, because there's an awful lot of uh, mud in that lake, and, and, and I think, uh, I mean, in the Stan area. And I think if they get it all done nice, it will be look pretty nice. I'm hoping around, I'm still around by the time you guys get it done. <laughs> by the <laughs> Chris says probably the same. Hopefully we see it when we're done, right? <laughs> did you do any ice skating on the pond when you I, I never did, no, but okay. uh, we always, uh, did our skating in back of the old firehouse. Oh, okay. We had a pond there, and that's where we had to shovel that off, and we did our skating down there. But okay. I remember a lot of people uh, skating on the pond down there. But okay. It was, uh, I would say it was very dangerous. Okay. Because uh, of the water flow, and uh, it, it was under the ice there. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I never thought of skating down there. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Irene Dine. Thank you, Irene. Um, we walked across that uh, dam every day when we went to school and went home. And the next, well, it would have been the Monday after that storm, we did see the chickens floating on the lo on the logs down the creek. Okay. Oh. So, uh, and I went ice skating on there too. Oh, you did too. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. That's it. <laughs> Anybody else have any recall on those that eventful day? Walter, you got anything on hand? <laughs> I'm Walter Gress, and yes, I did go ice skating on there. And uh, I'm probably the only one that ever drove a, Ford, a 28 international truck over to the dam. <laughs> and ice on the dam and stored it in that big oh, mill. Okay, okay. Now, how did you uh, get it? Did you saw it, or how did you get that ice? Sawed it and hauled it up for 28 weapons. Okay. And they stored it for f in the summertime for okay. cooling things? For cooling, for picnics. Okay. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Appreciate it. Please? I'm Kathy Sixel. Walter, was that the firehouse that we saw on that one picture behind the dam? 
that was the firehouse. And also, was there an ice house that was, you know, more toward Lake Michigan at one time? Stratman's Ice House, yeah, that could be, and that was do down toward Hika Park, right? Okay, thank you. Where is the apartment? Where is the apartment building? Well, that apartment building is okay. By the east one. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? Do you have anything else to add? Just a big thank you for coming. Well, thank I you for I think we owe him a nice round of applause. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank Jim for the wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, and we'll have you again, and we will be doing more DVDs as the project goes along, and it should start soon, right? Also, we're going to have a surprise program next month. We don't know yet what it's going to be because we had a switch in the schedule. So we're going to come up with something, so that's all I can tell you, and it will be August 13th, right? I don't know what room either yet, so... Okay, I'm Kathy Sixel, and everybody get home safe. Thank you for coming, and thank you also, Jim, again. Janet Miller. Thank you. Philip Kanoff. Thank you. Marie Pippert. Thank you. <laughs> Rick Fireser. Good, thank you. Bob uh, Domogolski. Thank you. Doris Kettman. Thank you. Clark Krupe. Good. Paul Schwinn. Good. Walter Chris. Thank you, Walter. Good Patty answer. Krupe. Thank you for coming. Jen Huntsman. Thank you for coming also. John Wiegand. Thank you, John. Ken Smazzo. Thank you. I'll take the mic for you. I'll catch this young lady. Kirsten Husband. Thank you. Irene Dine. Good. Allison Zaya. Thank you. Thank you for your recall. Niles Claus. Thanks for coming. Richard Schwartz. Thank you. Earl Eldrick. Thank you. Russ Tooley. Good. Charlie Bauer from Milton. Thank you, Charlie. You have a gentleman here. Great day, please. Once again, thanks for coming tonight.